So should we start? Or oh, no, yeah, I'll, I'll so, wait for you to do. I, I'll, yeah. I'll wait for you. To do. Yes. So now we are live. Um, so hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and or good. Yeah. Uh, to, to everyone. So uh, thank you for coming to our uh, last webinar on uh, the politics and aesthetic of post and anti-pandemic condition. Um, so we have uh, two uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, we have Dr. Joshun and uh, Dr. Christos Linteris. So I'm going to um, introduce them uh, first and uh, then uh, Dr. Joshun will um, will begin and then uh, Dr. Uh, Christos Linteris. So this webinar is organized by the French Center, uh, French Research Center on Contemporary China uh, in Taipei. And I'm very happy to have you both and uh, have uh, all the uh, audience member on YouTube uh, at the same time. So <clears throat> Dr. Josun is a reader in history at the University of Essex. Uh, so Dr. Jo is uh, among a growing number of historians who are pioneering the history of the PRC uh, using new oral and archival uh, evidence. Uh, she produced a documentary and oral history works on the Great Famine in China. And she is also the author of the forthcoming book, uh, The People's Health, Health Intervention and Delivery in Mao's China, 1949-1983, uh, which is due in August this year. Um, using unseen archival sources from across China and extensive oral interviews, uh, with the participants at the expert and grassroots level, uh, this book sets out to develop a nuanced understanding of the Chinese approach to health, exploring the process through which the PRC health system was conceived and the political context in which they were and could be evaluated. And uh, our second uh, speaker, Dr. Christoph Linteris, uh, is a medical anthropologist, a senior lecturer in social anthropology at the University of St. Andrews. His research focuses on the anthropological and historical examination of infectious disease epidemics, animal to human infection, medical visual culture, epidemiological epistemology, colonial medicine, global health, and epidemics as events posing an existential risk to humanity. So he recently published uh, Human Extension and the Pandemic Imaginary. Uh, in 2019, and Sulfuric Utopias, A History of Maritime Fumigation in 2020 with Lucas Engelman. So uh, now, without further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Josun for uh, her uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, Dr. Josun, it's, uh, it's you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, listener. Um, I just received my copy of the book. So yeah, um, I, I would really love to hear your comments about it. Um, but I, I, so I'll, I'll get on with some, um, you know, the talk, not to waste it any more time. But um, yeah, I, I would love to hear, you know, kind of um, if you read it, then um, then I would like to hear your comments. Um, I'm just going to share the screen. I hope. I, I tried to put a PowerPoint up, but um, it doesn't seem to be working. Um, wait a minute. Okay. Is it? Oh, it's good. Okay. Right. Okay, good. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, and um, so for countless millennium, um, viruses that have shared our planet and bodies. So in so many ways, the COVID-19 pandemic we are experiencing now is um, a very traditional phenomenon. This can certainly be seen through the lens in how community responded to it. The idea of preventing spread of disease demanded looking at the social control as providing some sort of immediate intervention to preserve life is not new. Yeah, since the early modern period, say for 14, from 14th century, from the time of the Black Death to the present, there has been continuing attempts to eliminate factors that are seen as damaging or threats to human life and to human health. In modern times, there is also this belief that um, health is right, guaranteed by the state. 
So modern institutions such as the political authorities, as well as credentialed medical practitioners and scientists have been entrusted with this political role to guard and improve the people's health. So I would argue that public health intervention is always a political act. In modern China, politics and health are uh, intricately linked. From the onset of the Chinese Revolution in the early 1920s, uh, it, sorry, in the early 20th century, public health objectives were an integral part of the ideology of revolution. The overwhelming poverty in China linked to poor hygiene and health of the Chinese population single to China's backwardness to the world. So China, the image like this, yeah, it's a China was a sick man of Asia in so many ways. And revolutionaries and social reformers in and outside of China, include Western medical missionaries, believed that improving health and medical care of the Chinese population would therefore open the door for modernization. Sun Yat-sen, the leader of the Chinese revolution, he, he was um, a trained um, physician in allopathic medicine. Um, equally, in kind of Mao, Mao, Mao was still, in kind of from very early on when he was still a very young communist leader, he understood that the public health work would, could be utilized as a tool to win the support of the masses. Um, in 1933, and he, he was a communist branch leader and faced with some heavy criticism from the CCP central leadership. He urged his comrades, the communist cadres in Jiangxi, that's where they based, yeah, to attend to ordinary people's health, everyday health needs. This is what he said. Many people suffered from boils and other ailments. What are we going to do about it? All such problems concerning the well-being of the masses should be placed on our agenda. We should convince the masses that we represent their interests, that our lives are intimately bound up with theirs. We should help them to proceed from these things to an understanding of the higher tasks which we have put forward, the tasks of the revolutionary move, so that they will support the revolution and spread it throughout the country, respond to our political appeals and fight to the end of the victory in the revolution. So when the revolution was won, after the CCP seized the power in 1949 and established a strong centralized communist state, the known as the People's Republic of China, I'll use PRC um, you know, in my talk, Health had played an outsized role in the internal politics of the new communist state and at the same time came in complex ways to define the PRC globally. I would say this is still um, very much the case today in how the authority in Beijing responded to the COVID crisis. So throughout the Mao era, public health work came to be one of the central means of impacting and influences the masses. Public health campaigns were simultaneously political campaigns. This um, poster uh, from the Chinese poster net, you know, kind of staff them had, you know, um, put them together. And I'm just, they are there. Those, those images are very telling. I don't have to say very much about them. You know, kind of they, um, they're very explanatory, you know, kind of, so yeah, public health campaigns were simultaneously political campaigns. And at the same time, um, the CCP leadership also understood the propaganda power of the promise of healing and health. Historically, um, in China, epidemic, war, and natural disasters, include famine, had been seen as signs singularly the loss of the mandate of heaven which led to the downfall um, of many dynasties. Um, one example is beginning with, you know, kind of the Yellow Turban Rebellion in the second century AD, almost all sectarian insurgents in Chinese history had involved some form of faith healing. The texts we receive, 
tells us that the John Brother, yeah, who led the Yellow uh, um, Turban Rebellion, they were faith healers. And so uh, um, one of the strategies they used to, to draw the believer was, uh, you know, kind of to perform healing through using charm water. Um, similarly, the, um, the, the Battle of the Red Cliff um, in two, two, um, 208 AD, 208 AD, and uh, um, you, um, the, the, the defeat of Cao Cao's army, um, according to you know, uh, Sima Qian or Zizi Tongjian, it was caused by an outbreak of mysterious disease. And as a result of um, the defeat of Cao Cao's army in the Battle of Red Cliff, China was divided into three warring states entering the Three Kingdom period, um, we also known as the period of disunity, and this period is certainly remembered in Chinese history book as one of the bloodiest periods. So you see, health, you know, kind of has always played very important in kind of role in sort of Chinese history. And so between 1949 until 1983, for more than 30 years, the CCP leadership made eradicating diseases and improving the health of the entire population a central pillar of its policy. Of its policies. And the centerpiece of the PRC's public health campaign was the anti schistosomiasis campaign, which was one of the, um, you know, the campaign I studied um, in great detail in my book. Okay, and um, I'll just say a little bit about the schistosomiasis, you know, kind of why schistosomiasis was um, such an important disease for the new communist state. Uh, you know, kind of to, um, you know, um, to target. So schistosomiasis is interrelated with the predominant agricultural way of life, especially for the rice growing farmers in rural China. Schistosomiasis had been endemic um, in much of the rice growing regions along and the south of Yangtze River. And historically, the disease had evoked widespread fear in these regions. In the first half of the 20th century, social reformers, many of them were Western trained public health experts, believed the disease have contributed to infertility. And this was linked um, to underpopulation and poor productivity. And so, you know, kind of both were seen as the underlying causes for China's rural poverty. Chen Fang Zihi, um, I, I had a, a you know, kind of, um, problem find a picture in the end, I located it in a Japanese book. So Chen Fang Zihi was a graduate of the, um, he was a native of Zhejiang, he sort of grown up, you know, kind of uh, witnessed the damage caused by schistosomiasis. He was a graduate of Imperial Tokyo University's medical school, which um, is a school taught the German system. Yeah, he, um, after, you know, kind of, um, after his graduation, he became the first director of the Nationalist Ministry of Interior's um, Sanitary Department. And then later on, he headed the Nationalist Ministry of Health um, Central Hygiene Laboratory in Shanghai. Um, he, for instance, labeled schistosomiasis the disease of national humiliation. According to him, uh, you know, schistosomiasis has injured China's national economy as well as people's livelihood. So to control schistosomiasis for him and many of his contemporaries should be a shared responsibility for every Chinese person. So immediately upon the founding of the PRC in 1949, schistosomiasis was elevated to one of the most serious diseases that needed to be combated viewed as vital to the national security and to productivity and the military manpower of the new state, fighting the disease came to stand for fighting for social, um, fighting for socialism. Um, there was some also, um, you know, kind of this, this was one uh, in Ping Ping Ping, who was one of the region, of, you know, badly affected by schistosomiasis. And there was one of the prayed um, schistosomiasis control parade during the Korean War. So to defeat schistosomiasis is, um, the poster says, to defeat schistosomiasis is to support the Korean War. Um, 
this um, the military importance of uh, you know controlling schismosis was also linked to um, that's how the disease first sort of alerted to the communist authority was when the communist army was um, um, before they had liberated you know kind of uh, the uh, the Yangtze region was took over the Yangtze region and uh, um, they when they were crossing. Um, the Yangtze, you know, during the you know, kind of preparing for the battle to cross the Yangtze, um, many of the communist army soldiers they they came from the north, yeah, they um, so they had to receive they they're not used to fighting in the water, so they had to re um, you know kind of have and uh, receive intensive swimming lesson and training, and uh, so this took place uh, in the part of the Yangtze that uh, you know kind of tributes of Yangtze and uh, near um, Anhui province. And as a result, um, you know, kind of thousands of soldiers were suddenly fairly ill. And uh, um, the communist um, army doctors, most of them also came from Manchuria. They had no clue, um, you know, kind of what um, this um, disease was. So they treated the soldiers with, you know, kind of, they thought it was malaria or other, uh, um, diseases, then they treated that accordingly, but it was ineffective. So um, eventually they engaged some local doctors and uh, immediately they were told this was a schistosomiasis. So, you know, kind of, as you see that uh, she's, to control the schistosomiasis was uh, you know, kind of, of um, military importance, but also, you know, kind of, um, um, yeah, when um, later on, when the communist army, you know, kind of um, was some um, trying to, um, you know, kind of proceed to Taiwan and that would also involve in, um, you know, like fighting in the water. So um, it was, they were warned that, you know, kind of you have to control the you know, kind of in the water. Um, so it was, it was of military importance. Okay. So, um, but um, at the same time, the um, control work also linked Schistosomiasis control work also linked allopathic medicine and public health work with ongoing legitimization of the new order. So, uh, you know, kind of, um, it allowed, um, it provided com a convenient um, allergy for emphasizing the need for state, uh, state intervention. Yeah, it also allowed it to take over of existing uh, medical and health institutions went smoothly. And um, um, for the medical community in these regions, and um, they too favored state intervention because one of the arguments was the, the former government, the nationalist government, um, lacked the political will. Yeah, they were not interested in controlling the, the disease. That's why it, you know, kind of the disease was so prevalent in the region. So um, they, uh, were the, the communist, the new communist authorities. You know, commitment to control the disease was uh, welcomed. You know, kind of um, by um, the the medical community um, and uh, you know, kind of um, the scientific-minded reformers in this region. Furthermore, and um, as the schistosomiasis is a disease which afflicted people in many parts of the underdeveloped world, and uh, schistosomiasis was also known as the national disease of Egypt. Um, it was thought that it would bring prestige to the new communist state as well as to the Chinese scientists if the PRC would be the first country in, in, you know, in the world to eliminate it. So to succeed in this medical and public health challenge that Western experts had failed was a price worth winning for. As time goes on, um, the political importance of the disease would grow um, towards the end of 1955, mm -hmm. as Mao was mounting the socialist high tide to bring the socialist revolution or socialist storm, that, that was the term he used after, to the Chinese countryside. He and the state council um, again singled out to schismosis for it to be erect. This, um, in the early stage, it was still the control the disease, but um, you know, kind of by this time, the um, language has changed. The disease is to be eradicated. It was argued that the disease was resulted from the traditional way of life. So to bring a socialist cultural revolution to the Chinese countryside, 
it would entail eradicating schistosomiasis by changing the prevailing custom and habit, yi feng yi su, was the term used. And um, the national goal was to eradicate in seven years. Um, and, um, and so instead of, you know, kind of um, ask the Ministry of Health to be in charge of the eradication program, Mao had to put, um, you know, uh, Ke Qing Si, he was the party boss um, of the Eastern region, um, Eastern China. He had no, you know, kind of experience in public health work. But um, since this is going to be a political undertake, it doesn't really matter. So Ke Qing Si was uh, put in charge of the program and the, uh, national, the, the first national uh, conference on, on eradicating schistosomiasis was held. And at the conference, this is what Ke Qing Si said, we must eradicate the disease within seven years and uh, transform rural villages into a disease-free socialist garden. So the national goal was to eradicate in seven years. This did not happen, however. Um, at the time, first it, the scientists who were, you know, kind of experts, as you can see next to Ke um on the, I don't know whether it's right or left side on your side, um, the, the old gentleman, he was a pseudonym, he was an expert in systems and myosis control work, you know, kind of, um, and um, he had to, um, when, when he heard, when he received the, you know, kind of um, the documents about, you know, kind of um, calling for eradicating the disease in seven years, he just, um, he said, that's not possible. He actually confronted Mao. He said, you know, kind of this just, it's not feasible, you know, in uh, the present condition of China. And um, um, this is just not possible. But um, he was quickly silenced. Um, so later on, you know, in 1957, he was labeled a writer for, um, you know, kind of spreading um, what he called the um, fanning cold wind, yeah, in feng, why in feng, and, you know, kind of to the campaign. Um, equally, in the first decades of the PRC, central um, economic and the political planning was dragged out in chaotic and disorderly haste across the country. As with many other aspects involved in centralization, the central authority's sense of urgency with regard to eradicating schistosomiasis caused the local responses to the complexity and the haste implementation of such a massive public health campaign to be fragmented And uh, in quite often, you know, kind of the local responses were quite contradictory. So the picture emerged from the ground up. I I, I don't really have time to go into um, great detail, but you know, kind of in my book, um, you know, I have written this um, extensively. So the picture emerged from the ground up is that as soon as they encountered the wide variety of human experiences of health disease and indeed changing politics because the politics changes very quickly in this period of China as well. The great plans on paper were transformed into makeshift solutions that bore little or no resemblance to the original political project. So to overcome obstacles in early stage of the campaign, the frontline workers or the CCP coders managing the day-to-day -day control of the disease, they, in, in Chinese is a term for them, they call the schistosomiasis control coders, they understood the need to be persuasive rather than authoritarian in their approach. So this was reflected in the extensive public health propaganda as well as in the more detailed and local organization organizational work during this period. So um, in the sense that the success as, uh, you know, kind of um, um, as shown in the official propaganda was largely a propaganda work, yeah, rather than real success, but that was um, the narrative uh, we were giving and the world is given. Um, and so with the advent of the Great Leap Forward, there was ever greater political demand to speed up the goal of eradication by eliminate snails, the victor. Yeah. Um, oh, 
sorry, I missed um, one of the slides, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, so um, um, yeah, and the, this um, um, at the time, this was again, you know, kind of how science sort of, uh, you know, kind of um, had to give way, you know, to the political decision because scientists like experts needing the, the campaign, yeah, they had to um, preferred, you know, kind of to kill the snails to control the victor and um, through the chemical control method. And, um, but um, um, for, from the, um, uh, but the Japanese experts invited by Joe and I, who on that hand recommended, you know, kind of um, eliminating the snail through engineer methods. And this, um, recommendation had fit quite well with um, the greatly forward um, because greatly forward kicked off by you know kind of um, um, water conservation um, uh, needed more land yet to uh, you know kind of to produce more food but also um, you know kind of um, the to improve um, food productivity meant uh, you know kind of a, a massive um, water conservation work so both go quite well with some um, you know kind of um, um, cleaning snails um, through engineering work uh, uh, recommended by the Japanese um, experts. So land reclamation, um, it was purely a political decision in the end. So land reclamation and the um, irrigation scheme were methods used to bury and kill the snails. Um, in the end, this scheme not only proved extremely costly and wasteful, they also ran into you know, kind of conflict with the system for water conservation and contributing to severe floods as well as causing alkalization in the soil. So in the end, um, you know, the reclamation um, initiatives had to be abandoned. And um, you know, as soon as, um, you know, kind of um, um, the work is being abandoned, then the smells returned. Um, and then, so, um, you know, in desperation, then they, um, they switched back to cleaning the snail using, um, you know, kind of chemical control method, uh, methods, yeah. And uh, um, the, the using the melocytus, and but the using melocytus damaged the ecosystem and uh, left non nasty negative consequences on the environment. Um, so uh, if control smells doesn't work, um, then they turned um, to, you know, kind of um, um, mass treatment. So on um, this period of you know, kind of radical and uh, rapid political changes also saw the intensification on the side of direct treatment through the application of the shorter causes um, of um, the highly toxic anatomy and um, Tata, you know, Tata and Mick. This was a standard treatment used at the time, um, you know, um, to to control the infection through pharmaceutical intervention. Yeah, um, the standard treatment was twenty day and uh, twenty days, but um, since the greatly forwards or the uh, you know kind of the goal of eradication couldn't wait, so uh, local um, you know kind of authorities in charge of the of the campaign on the local level they reduced the treatment. Um, from uh, you know kind of 20 days first 20 days to seven days and then from seven days to three days and in Zhejiang province they even reduced the treatment day to two days this means you know kind of by reducing uh, reducing the length of the treatment they had to include the dosage as a result many people died from the intervention aimed to cure them at the same time, the Utopia project of the Great Forwards aimed to transform in the Chinese countryside into a communist paradise free of disease, subsequently led to the worst famine in history, which lasted for four years between 1958 and 1962 and claimed tens of millions of lives as well as many animals. The famine, needless to say, also complicated the um, eradication campaign. So towards the end of the Great Forward, in the early 1960s, the morbidity rates had risen sharply. And in the... Okay, um, so, um, yeah, so in, by 1962, more than 10,000 farmers were infected 
um, with she's surmises while harvesting rice you know, in Hubei um, province, one county. In the same year, and, um, and acute infections were reported over 50 counties. Um, and in 1963, um, 6, over 6,000 cases of acute collective infection were reported in Jiangsu province. And this is after, you know, kind of um, China had declared in 1958 that uh, Yujiang was the first place on earth had eradicated schistosomiasis, but in fact, it didn't happen yet. There was a propaganda war. Um, so um, by 1962, and uh, you know, kind of towards the end of the famine, the morbidity rate was in fact on the rise. And in the meantime, snails returned. So the villagers, um, you know, kind of, they mocked. So, um, so they said, in the winter, we say farewell to the plague god, the schistosomiasis, and in the spring, we will come back snails. So um, yeah, um, officials saw as officials saw the promise of go of Shishimasa's eradication and the rural utopian go. Um, rural utopia it was helped to create slipping away um, from them. The um, they so they the they the, the more authoritarian sort of you know kind of um, um, means of controlling the disease came into play, and uh, um. As a result, you know, kind of, um, the, the, there's a lot of problems, yeah. So they had to, and um, in 1963, um, at a national uh, Shizuza Masses Control um, Conference, they had to address, they had no choice but to had, had to address, address the failure. And um, Sun Yong, um, Yong he was the new party boss from Yujiang County, which was the, uh, the county in Jiangxi province, which had declared you know, successful in eradicating schistosomiasis. I, I have an entire chapter about how this was made up, you know, uh, you know, the success was created. Yeah, um, and uh, so he had to admit, um, you know, kind of the failure. Yeah, this, um, so he said, you know, kind of many schistosomiasis control coders thought they had uh, um, completed the historical mission and they beat their gongs and retreated. So, um, in 1961, more than uh, 2,000 uh, meters of snail infested land were found. In 1963, you know, kind of, um, over 400 people were diagnosed with the disease and uh, with 24 severe cases. This had been, uh, there had been miscalculation of snail numbers in the previous year. So he, you know, kind of, he was trying to, you know, pass the bucket, you know, to, you know, his predecessors. Yeah. And, um, and and Wei Wenbo, he was, at this stage, he was in charge of the national campaign. And then um, he had to, you know, kind of um, to uh, sort of give overall evaluation of, you know, the failure of the campaign. So this is what he you know, kind of said at the end of the conference. Some places immediately claimed they had eradicated disease after a few days of shock work. That was the standard of practice. So you, you do the shop work and then, then you pass the test and then that's it. Whereas those responsible for verifying the result were too sloppy. As such, the estimates were often too high under pressure. 167 counties and municipalities hurried to declare near eradication. In many places, the grassroots is just the miles country work has run into a vicious circle. This is very interesting. So I, you know, kind of, um, um, when I was doing my project, I was trying to find out, you know, kind of what actually, uh, you know, how this actually happened on the ground. And um, one of, um, so I, oh dear. Okay, um, I, I interviewed this, um, Both the villagers and the cult, local cultists who were in charge of the campaign in Hubei province. Yeah. And so I, I thought I'd give you an example from Hubei province because um, it's you know, kind of relevant to today. Um, and one of the villagers um, said, you know, kind of um, um, 20 of us were sent to kill snails covering 150 um, square meters. Um, 
that's just not possible. It's completely fairy tale. Yeah. Um, we so obviously he was saying that you know they never really did work. It was just not possible. And some um, another um, coder, he was in charge of the local um, you know kind of snail king campaign, and um, and it's very telling her you know um, um, her interview, and she said. Um, those figures were made up by coders who filled the forms. There is a local saying, figures produces coders, so you get promotion that way, yeah, by, you know, to produce astronomic figures, yes, the figures of the seas. So snail killing camping only lasted um, for a short while. Our superior knew that all along, they had grown used to the practice of overestimates and forged figures. It's an open secret. Um, in, this brings us to you know kind of how um, you know kind of who Bay or you know kind of you know what happened during the COVID nineteen crisis. You know, kind of first um, took hold who Bay province Wuhan, yeah, and um, um, to this day, I would say that health intervention, delivery, and financing system remained fragmented in China. On the ground, each provincial authority is responsible for allocating resources to implement national level health policies, which may be at odds with local interests. They often treat national policies as merely guidelines and are not obliged to implement them, whether due to lack of funding resources or local interests. That's always important, local interests. On the other hand, with their eyes fixed on more state subsidies and for the next opportunity for promotion. So, you know, kind of, yeah, the figures producing cutters. Yeah, local authorities and officials are always more interested in showing their superior in Beijing how well any specific locality is doing in terms of health rather than being seen as a problem. Um, at the same time, even at the national level, health resources in China were managed by different sectors. Coordination between them has always been problematic. So in crisis situations, such as during the outbreak in Wuhan um, earlier this year, such a fragmentation severely in, um, impeded crisis management. It also exposed the authorities' consistent lack of transparency in acknowledging any disease outbreak threatening to public health. So I would argue that the early tragedy in Wuhan was um, much a man-made catastrophe as a biological one. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to sort of a little bit more sort of, you know, kind of to um, the Mao era again. In the aftermath of the um, greatly famine, yeah, in the early 1960s, famine related oedema and geologic problems and the child malnutrition become widespread in the countryside. And unable to cope with the crisis, the, PR, the, the PRC's rural health system literally collapsed. And the people um, by this time had, you know, kind of completely lost the trust in the um, um, in the Communist Party and in the state health system. So they turned back to local traditional practitioners, include witchcraft, and the exorcism was sort of become very widespread throughout the country. And um, it was from, uh, you know, the um, these localized initiatives, or people also, you know, kind of took, you know, kind of things into their own hands. They had lots of local initiatives. Yeah, and to provide to take care of everyday health needs. And it was from these localized initiatives emerged the better for doctors. And to, pro to prove the in infallibility of the socialist utopia project, Mao and the CCP leadership rebranded the better for doctors as Chairman Mao's revolutionary approach to healthcare and launched it as a, a nationwide program. This was their attempt once again to turn the masses into believers with the promise of health and healing. And um, came by the 1970s, um, the Barefoot Doctor program, or also known as the Chinese approach to health, 
become the public face of the PRC in its relationships with the first and the third world. And um, the, um, I mean, the PRC um, in leadership understood it globally and they sold it to the WHO. And, um, and so the then director, you know, because the leaders of WHO, um, they feel strongly that this Chinese experience uh, in tackling, successfully tackling, it was never really successful in China, as my book shows, but um, but um, the, the story was sold, yeah, the narrative, the successful narrative was sold. So um, the, this Chinese experience in successfully tackling a um, health problem with limited financial technolo um, technological and human resources should be promoted around the world. And this um, led to the adaptation of health for all, um, by the World Health Assembly as its goal to be achieved by the year 20, um, 2000. And it was formally included in the um, Declaration of Ahmad Atta. Uh, in the meantime, the um, PRC leadership also realized that health initi initiatives could be inexpensive but profitable um, undertakings, which um, could boost the effort to promote a new national, um, a new international order. So between 1963 and 1989, the PRC uh, uh, sent medical teams to more than 40 countries in Africa. Uh, oh, sorry, here. So the, these were the poster from the time. So you know, kind of the spread of friendship with the silver needle of acupuncture, and um, they. Um, this was um, in Somalia, yeah, and um, you know, during the new year, and some um, people um, danced and sing the East is Red, and uh, so and and they called the German Mao our savior, you know, we come to help us, and so this obviously paid off, and um, at the UN and the PRC's increasing medical humanitarian activities and the bonds of friendship created through such undertakings helped the PRC win its battle against the, the Republic of China, Taiwan, for the permanent Chinese seat and the UN Security Council. And this, this is largely because, you know, kind of, um, 26 African nations, he, they voted in favor of le uh, legitimacy in the state of the PRC in the UN. Oh, so what I'm saying, yeah, um, as my title suggests, the public health is a political act. Yeah, the public in public health is not simply the public sphere as a kind of loosey-goosey category. In most cases, individuals' understanding of how one functions in the world is shaped and directed by the national state and the neighbors. Clearly, Mao understood this. Um, I would argue that this is also the case with the current leadership. Just as Mao used the promise of health to turn the masses into believers, the current leadership has choreographed a narrative of triumph out of initial crisis. They quickly grasped the failure to control the COVID-19 could cost the parties its legitimacy and launched the political campaign to compact the disease. So as public health work in the PRC has served as one of the central means of impacting and influencing the masses or the public. They have also turned the political campaign against the COVID-19 into a moral crusade involving the entire Chinese nation. In the meantime, with the spread of disease globally as well as the xenophobic anti-Chinese discourse in some Western countries, the official propaganda in China has turned the COVID-19 into a menace from outside. First from the United States, and now it's from Europe, yeah? And by evoking the memory of the 100-day national humiliation, the COVID-19 has become a new opium plague that Western, or in particular the United States, or now Europe, as I said, Europe, you know, is using to hobble China's rise. Such nationalistic rhetoric is um, quite effective in diverting people's attention away from the early tragedy in Wuhan. And to an extent, um, the um, party leadership has managed to rally support um, in a kind of from um, people all around the country, large section of the population in China, as well 
uh, as amongst the Chinese um, overseas in this alleged united front we are having a united you know kind of um, effort um, or a common goal to fight the COVID-19. So nationalism for those of you who watch China um, closely, nationalism is clearly on the rise in China right now. And globally, the um, PRC leadership also understood the ability or inability to control the disease would affect China's image as a major world economy and power. And capitalizing on the growing crisis in the United States and in Europe, the official media in China have waged the intense propaganda war trumpeting China's purported, purported success in controlling the disease. Um, like the Maoist anti-Sismiasis campaign and the Bay of the Doctor program, this time again, they have sold the narrative of success to the WHO and around the world. China has also sent medical missions to countries such as Italy. And two weeks ago, you probably heard it already, President Xi had pledged to assess African nation to fight the disease. I think um, I'm actually um, overrun the time. Um, so I'm going to stop it here. Um, yeah, Nathan. Yeah, t t thank you, uh, Josian, for, for this uh, amazing uh, report on, uh, on uh, past and present pandemics. Um, if you can, can you uh, uh, turn off here? Yeah. Perfect. Um, thank you. So, 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 thank you again, and uh, thank you for uh, all the audience that uh, here today. Uh, so, without further ado, I will uh, give the floor uh, to uh, Christos. Um, thank you. Very much. And uh, yeah, you are you are sharing your screen. Perfect. Yeah, in the screen. Yeah. Good. So, <clears throat> a key a key trope in the way in which COVID nineteen is depicted today in mass as well as social media is the reconquest of the earth by nature. Rather than it being construed as the final act in some drama involving the revenge of nature, this is rather envisioned as the default and indeed imminent effect of the retreat of human agency in the world. For decades, this has also been a persistent theme in pandemic movies, novels, comic books, and video games, particularly those depicting the triumph of an apocalyptic pathogen. By contrast to representations of the time during an imaginary pandemic, which are usually those of anarchy and chaos, the representation of the post-pandemic world is one dominated by, by what we may call a pathetic anomie. In the iconic post-pandemic short story by T.C. Boyle, After the Plague, we read, the rat race was over, the freeways were clear all the way to Sacramento, and the poor, dwindling, ravaged planet was suddenly big and mysterious again. When the protagonist of Boyle's short story eventually drives down from his mountain post where he has survived the plague, what he finds is an accelerated process of rewilding. The local town, we read, looked now as if it had been deserted for decades. Weeds had begun to sprout up through invisible cracks in the pavement. Dust had settled over the idle gas pumps and the windows of the main building were etched with grime. Though only a few months had passed since the outbreak, the world, in Boyle's words, already seemed primeval. Everywhere, the untended gardens ran wild, the lawns became fields, the orchards forests, and I took to walking round the neighborhood with a baseball bat to ward off packs of feral dogs for which Alpa would never again materialize in a neat bowl in the corner of a dry and warm kitchen. End of quote. This image of nature hurrying up to reclaim the world as if it had been held back by humanity for millennia and now managed to surge through like some gas under pressure is a pervasive theme of post-pandemic narratives. The process of frenetic reclaiming of the urban terrain by nature in particular needs to be more precisely identified as a process through which the urban jungle reverts into a real one. The image is familiar to audiences of movies like I Am Legend, where in the iconic opening scene, Will Smith wanders through a savanna like Manhattan, rife with thriving wildlife. In a feature 
uh, of the New York Magazine on the movie, we read that creating the particular illusion of a verdant, depopulated Manhattan took $40 million of the film's $150 million budget. The film's director, Francis Lawrence, defended this decision in a manner that underlines the accelerated nature fantasy involved. And he says, most apocalyptic movies are very dark with burnt out cities. The truth is that if people, if people left, nature would start reclaiming the city pretty quickly. There are two contrastive images that may help us understand the mythocosmological operation of pandemic born urban rewilding. First and most famously, the image of a ruined post-nuclear world, as this was developed and presented in a great number of novels and films in the course of the Cold War. Whether in fictional or docudrama variants of the theme, the world after the nuclear end was uniformly depicted as a glo global ruin. In a far-reaching metonymic act in the nuclear imaginary, human survival is often played out in deserts. The Book of Ellie, which you can see at the top, uh, 20, uh, 2010 film, is an example of this, but similar images also pervade less action-oriented post-nuclear disaster narratives, like the classic a, Do a Boy and His Dog from 1975 in the image below. Simil similarly, when post-nuclear drama is played out in urban settings, it deploys the image of deserted cities. As Yael Navarro has stressed, developing an idea first formulated by Walter Benjamin, ruination is productive of affective spaces. In post-nuclear narratives, remnants of humanity rummage through such spaces in search for both material and affective resources, mainly memories of what used to be to be human. By contrast, the renaturalized city of the post-pandemic imagination is not a cathartic landscape of ruination and mourning, but of life unbound. Although post-pandemic cities like post-nuclear ones are deserted by humans, they are far from desertified. Instead, they, and indeed the entire globe, are portrayed as tropicalized. Take, for example, the visualization of cities in the popular post-pandemic computer game, The Last of Us, Series 1, uh, 2013, developed by Naughty Dog. Vegetation and trees aggressively engulf flagships of industrialism, like Pittsburgh. Herds of deer graze next to collapsed bridges with cars covered in moss. And in the iconic finale of the game, the protagonists, Joel and Ellie, encounter a tower of giraffes in the midst of Salt Lake City. The reflections of a review of this much discussed scene of the game are characteristic, and I read from, from a blog. Nature is claiming back land. Animals are emerging once again. All while, the human population is slowly dying out. We no longer present an essential force in this world. It is here that the second contrastive image comes into play. In order to accentuate the image of cities having turned feral, post-pandemic narratives borrow from, and in turn transform, a trope originally belonging not so much to nuclear apocalyptic fantasies as to the iconography of war. This is the image of iconic tropical animals or so-called tropical animals like lions or tigers roaming embattled cities like Sarajevo. The image arose in the context of post-Cold War visual culture of war with its function being reproduced as an aestheticized image of conflict as an unreasoned and anomic absurdity. Compare this image to I Am Legend, where as Will Smith is hunting deer in Times Square, he's confronted by a pride of lions, which has obviously escaped from uh, the New, New York Zoo. Uh, and this pride capture, captures his prized prey, the deer, with grace and ease. In its transformed role, wildlife thus, becomes, thus comes to connote no longer life besieged by human folly, as in the case of the siege of Sarajevo, but the triumph of natural life as a return of the repressed. This is not simply a return of the world to a natural state, but a process of embodying life's supposed propensity to naturalize even the most obscene artifacts of human civilization, like Times Square. This post-pandemic image relies on Western colonial fantasies of the tropics as primeval landscapes. 
landscapes where supposedly life itself emerged and where life and death are of such intensity that they become indistinguishable. Medical historians like David Arnold have long stressed the persistent relevance of colonial notions of the tropics. And David Arnold writes, as a conceptual and not merely physical space, the tropics have not only operated in juxtaposition with what were considered to be temperate areas or, or zones, but more importantly, he claims, instituted a topology of encounter for quote unquote, white men and women venturing into an unfamiliar world in which climate, vegetation, disease, and people all appear to be different and in which the familiar forms of temperate life were threatened, overturned, or inverted, end of quote. It was there that following Alexander von Humboldt, nature revealed itself in its fullest and most forceful character, making itself available for observation. Yet what started as a vision of earthly paradise was soon imbued with a sense of ever-present and indeed overabundant peril. For by the end of the 19th century, at the high noon of the colonial project, the tropics became a contested topos of imperial mastery, a field where tropical exuberance and tropical enormity threatened individual well-being and the colonial social order, and required the development of new ways of rendering intelligible and actionable the environment and the bodies inhabiting it. If the colonial experience thus entailed an encounter with this imagined as originary topos of fecundity, virulence, and death, it also entailed a reverse encounter. This comprised a dramatic engagement between white colonial civilization and the tropics, set not in the colonies, but in the temperate metropolis instead. This vision was structured around a peculiar reciprocity. In return for the spoils of empire, Europe and North America had no choice but to receive a host of unwanted stowaways, infectious diseases. Whether these were believed to be germs or miasmata, carried in tropical merchandise or native bodies, tropical diseases like yellow fever, cholera, and plague embodied a counter gift in anthropological parlance that became an inextricable part of imperial experience. This trope of what Rod Edmund has called returning fears is remobilized in the post-pandemic image of rewilded cities in the 21st century. But I would like to argue it does so with an added ontological edge. For the pandemic imaginary supplants this colonial medical geographical imagination with the notion that the so-called tropical virus, which is usually the prophesied agent of the so-called next pandemic, deriving as it does from the maximum of wilderness, does not simply bring a disease of tropical nature into the temperate zone, but rather renders the tropics into a universal ontological condition. Everything touched by the killer virus, with the exception of humans, and I will explain why, turns tropical. This metamorphosis is the result of the supposed propensity of the, pro of the tropics, on the one hand, to bring about an irrepressible abundance, or indeed imminence of life, and on the other hand, to bring about the lapse of civilization by leading to its stagnation, degeneration, and decay. Should we then consider this imaginary process of tropicalization as part of the mythocosmological variant that Deborah Danowski and Eduardo Viveros de Castro have identified as the return to wilderness? In their examination of different variants of the end of the world, the two authors, one a philosopher, the other an anthropologist, Note the persistence of the mythem of the Edenic world as a world without humans, what they call a pre-objective world of a pre-subjective humankind. In the case of the post-pandemic post condition, while the Edenic realm is reinstituted as a universal condition on Earth, this is not a topology that excludes humans, but rather one that includes them, albeit denuded of their humanity. It is only through this inclusive exclusion that the planetary return of the repress bars humans, not from Eden itself, but from the ecological utopia marked by the categorical merging of Eden and wilderness. While the entire world is transformed and indeed healed or rebalanced 
through this merging, humans continue to inhabit the world as a species apart. This is for the simple reason that in this newly rewilded world, humans themselves remain decisively unwild. For whereas in various films, novels, video games, etc., all plants and animals seem to be teeming with life and potential, in the imaginary post-pandemic world, humans appear to be completely devoid of an ability to adapt or re-emerge in any socially meaningful way. <coughs> Sorry. It is instructive to compare this image to post-apocalyptic narratives that depict humanity's collapse into what may briefly be coined as a hybrid of savage and barbarian sociality. Nomadic hordes led by charismatic, if crude leaders engaging in pillage or obscene rituals in an excess of life in the midst of affective and often sexualized ruins. This image is part of nuclear narratives uh, and presents us with an anthropological phantasmagoria, whereas Joseph Maskell has examined in detail, and I quote, the utopian potential and the traumatic effects of the, of the nuclear project are irreducibly interlinked. By contrast, to return to the example with which I started uh, this talk, in Boyle's short story, the protagonist reflects on the nuclear trope explicitly and confesses that, quote unquote, he has never been a fan of the apocalyptic potboiler, the doomsday film shot through, the, through with special effects and asinine dialogue or the cyberpunk version of a grim and relentless future. For the protagonist, what this genre has led us to expect did not materialize after the plague. And he says in the novel, there were no roving gangs. They were all dead to a man, woman, and tattooed punk. What characterizes the survivors instead is their inability, quote unquote, to organize anything either for better or worse. Thus, the physical and indeed ontological transformation of the world marked by the pandemic, the imaginary pandemic, leaves humankind's being in a state of double exclusion, no longer subjects of mastery over nature, but also not natural or wild. This is neither able to rebuild civilization nor capable of inhabiting the world like other animals. As a result, post-pandemic humans are not future savages inhabiting some ecological tropicalized Eden, Instead, post-pandemic humankind resembles more the pre-humans of Aeschylus's Prometheus band. Creatures roaming the earth, Aeschylus writes, just as shapes in dreams, beings abandoned to chance. We are thus faced with an existence that is pervaded by emptiness, something not referring simply to a depopulated earth, but more importantly to the idea that humanity has been emptied of its autopoetic agency, the technique in Aeschylus' terms to recreate itself through its relation to the world, following the latter's end as a world for oneself. Two elements may then be said to form the cornerstone of the post-pandemic condition in the pandemic imaginary. A, humankind's incapacity to conceive and refashion its relation with the world as intelligible and actionable, and be humankind's incapacity to reinvent itself by turning collapse into an opportunity for a new way of being. Within the realm of the pandemic imaginary, this next pandemic then signals not simply the end of mastery, but the end of humanity's ability to reimagine and reinstitute what it is to be human for the simple reason that humanity's mastery of nature is supposed to be the sine qua non of any imaginable being human. Ontogeny is thus rendered impossible without mastery. Here then lies the instituting paradox of the pandemic imaginary. Whereas on the one hand, the idea of a pandemic born human extinction relies upon an understanding of the formation of new pathogens as processes of emergence, on the other hand, the result of the so-called next pandemic is identified with humanity's interdiction from emergence and re-emergence as an anthropological process. If we want to condense this into a formula, we would say that the next pandemic is imagined as an event where biological emergence leads to the end of anthropological emergence. 
This is not merely a barring of humankind from its ability to self-organize in the sense of being able to pick up what remains of itself after the pandemic collapse so as to reassemble some form of social organization, some source of savagery which through social evolution will eventually lead to civilization, but rather, and here I would like to conclude, it marks the suspension of humankind from the ontology of human creation, of self-creation, of autopoiesis as the core of humanity's species being. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christos. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, presentation on the imagination of uh, post-pandemic uh, uh, condition. Um, so uh, we're gonna start uh, the Q&A session uh, right now. So we have a bit of a de delay with, uh, with, the, with the live stream. Uh, so maybe we'll have a question arriving um, in a few moments. Um, so yeah, you can uh, you can ask your question on the on the YouTube comment uh, for people who are uh, watching us uh, right now. And I'm gonna take uh, the question uh, one by one. So th thank you again, uh, Christos and Josun, uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation uh, on uh, the pandemic. Um, which we are now uh, living in. So I'm gonna wait a bit to see uh, if we have any questions. So we have a, a question for Josun. Uh, has the creation of CDCs in China meant a rupture with Maoism politicized health? Uh, you, you, you are mute. Yeah. I, I didn't quite get the question, sorry. Uh, the creation of CDCs, uh, so the Center for Disease Control in China, uh -huh. uh, did it uh, meant a rupture with Maoism politicized health? Um, it's very interesting you ask that question. The creation of CDC is not um, really a question. It's just some um, uh, kind of, um, it's changing in names. And uh, it's, um, um, there is a Chinese, actually you kind of, because um, I had, um, I grew up in an uh, institution which is now called the CDC. Yeah, it used to be a center for disease control uh, or, you know, kind of um, um, the, it's special for a long time. It, it was um, um, opened the Sichuan Institute, um, you know, kind of for, for disease, uh, parasitic disease control. It was created uh, to eradicate schistosomiasis. So initially, its own task was to control schistosomiasis. As um, soon as schistosomiasis is grown out of its political importance, then it becomes a center for disease control. And after the SARS, and then um, all those institutions were converted, reconfigured to become CDC, yeah? And uh, uh, the people um, in the institute, they understood nothing has really changed. Um, so they said it's like um, calling, they, they use the Chinese, there's a two term uh, for tomato in Chinese. One is the Xi Hong Si, the other one is Fan Ti. So it's like uh, calling Xi Hong Si Fan Ti. Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a response. It's like uh, it's a China's uh, you know, kind of Chinese authorities trying to show they are doing something yeah, after the SARS crisis. But in fact, there's very little it's been done. It's just changing names. So the system of prevention is still remains very weak. So do I answer that question there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have uh, other questions from our audience? Wait a bit because we have a, a small delay. Um, Christos, I have um, um, something, you know, kind of when you were giving your talk, it just reminded me of something that uh, Rene Dubo in his Mirage of Health, he, he said in kind of, it's very interesting, it's the complete and lasting freedom from disease is but a dream remembered from the imagination of Garden of Eden designed for welfare of man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 
Yes. The mirage of all else. Yeah. <laughs> the mirage of health of comes. No, and and it, I mean, do we have more questions or? Okay, we, we we have more questions. Uh, I uh, I'm gonna read them. So for Christos, what spaces for politics are opened and closed by your evocative? And there I say totalizing account, which doesn't name agents of this pandemic imaginary. Right. So, I mean, agents of the pandemic imaginary are mentioned in the book, but the whole idea of, of the book, which this is half a chapter, uh, what I presented, is that the pand pandemic imaginary in itself is not bad or, or good. It's not uh, uh, simply closing or opening up uh, political spaces. It is doing both. As far as it is part of an instituted imaginary, to use Castoriadis' terms, of course it reproduces existing understandings of what humanity is, mainly a project for mastery, but it has also got a, an instituting uh, potential, again in Castoriadis' terms, it has a potential of helping us or aiding us think or conceive humanity as other than it is, or to to unthink, if you want, humanity itself, to unthink mastery. And that's why we need uh, ethnographic projects in order to study you know, the pandemic imaginary as this operates in specific communities. Now, what the book does is it, it, it throws out kind of a challenge to do that, drawing up a kind of the, the big kind of picture of things, mainly focusing on, on the instituted side of things rather than the instituting potential. I have another question for Christos. Um, so thanks for the presentation. Can Christos can say a bit more about anthropology of return to wilderness? Are they linked in both quoted authors? Can you quote them again with criticism of colonialism? Right, so the, especially within the COVID-19, there has been uh, quite a few anthropological works, blogs so far, of course, because it's been only three, four months, five months since people have started writing about this rewilding trope. Nagani Kamathur, for example, has written a great uh, blog piece for Somatosphere where this trope of rewilding of animals returning uh, into the cities is being problematized. Uh, and I think there, there is a growing number of anthropologists who are interested in the Anthropocene, but are also very, very cautious about this uh, this narrative as presented in, in the social media and mass media are engaged with. I'm, I'm not doing that work right now. So, uh, but I would uh, highly recommend Nagyani Kamathur's uh, Somatosphere piece. The uh, tropicalization uh, literature, I think David Arnold is the best source on this, on the tropics as a medicalized terrain. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have another question for uh, Nancy, Josie. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, stop, stop, stop. Nancy, stop imagining on um, picturing tropics. Yes, as um, well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I have another question for Josie. Uh, was uh, epidemic control racialized uh, during the Maoist period? Racialized? Yeah, according to racial uh, racial uh, uh, stereotypes. Um, I well, yes, yeah. In the sense, they um, they the the, the continue the, the 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 rhetoric, the discourse is still is there, but it doesn't really kind of play. A such an important role in the Chinese discourse during the Mao era, but certainly in the Republic um, period, there's lots of writings on, um, uh, you know, kind of the different race has different disease. Yeah, mm. the race and disease uh, are kind of linked. So uh, there is a categorization that um, in, you know, kind of in the Chinese scientific discourse or so medical discourse. Um, eugenics, on the other hand, mm. um, did play you know, kind of, um, it was important in um, throughout the Republican period, but also um, in the um, Maoist period as well. It was, yeah, it's seen as positive, it's positive eugenics. Yeah, it's good for the health of the population. Um, so I think, um, you know, kind of, 
I I I don't think I, I have you know kind of I haven't done any sort of you know kind of um, study on the Maoist period, so I can't really contribute to any more than sort of like uh, this is quite general picture. Um, Thank you. I think uh, you, you you responded very well to this uh, question. I have another question. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentations. Uh, I was wondering how oh, Mr. Linteris saw the growing fascination for runes, rune porn, uh, urbex within this history of post-pandemic condition. Sorry, can you repeat the question? How uh, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, how do you see the growing fascination for runes? Uh, so urbex, for example, going to ruins and uh, exploring ruins uh, within your history of post-pandemic condition. Yes, so, I mean, the fascination that, I mean, placing the post-pandemic condition, which is a minor uh, thing, if you want, in catastrophic or apocalyptic, secular apocalyptic imaginations in the 20th and 21st century, by contrast to the nuclear end, let's say, uh, within the context of ruination as a, a trope, as an apocalyptic trope, what we see again is that, uh, and that's what I, I, I try to, uh, to problematize in the book, is that whereas in the nuclear trope, for obvious reasons, we have ruins which are dead ruins, right? I mean, and uh, they, are, they are populated by mutants or things like that in, in some, some films, but they're moribund or, or, or dead. Uh, in the post-pandemic video games like The Last of Us, which is now making a new big hit with, a, with number two, has just come out a, a week ago, uh, the ruins are repopulated by nature. So it's not an end, right? The ruin in the post-pandemic imaginary, the book in the books and the novels and the films, is not an end. It is the beginning for a new nature, right? And it. so I think that the visual artists are mainly... Uh, drawing from Mayan ruins and ruins of kind of uh, of, of cities in, in kind of uh, tropics again or in the jungle. I think that's the reference there. And this again has a very deep colonial kind of uh, uh, history, a very troubled colonial history behind it. You know, why are we fascinated by the, you know, the, these fallen civilizations? You know, the colonial passion for these ruins was a very specific one. You know, they weren't just past civilizations, they were failed civilizations, right? You know, they were not contemplated in the same way as the colonial uh, uh, people were with the, you know, the British or the French uh, would contemplate the Parthenon, right? Uh, as a model, you know, for Le Corbusier or for modernism. No, the Mayan ruins are not a model for anything. You know, they're just, you know, they're beautiful to look at, but a bit nauseating as well. And, you know, they have a lesson. It's a cautionary tale of what, you know, a failed or a wrong path to civilization entails, right? So it's a very, very specific context uh, where from these images of kind of a, a ruined but verdant Manhattan comes from. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more, there's no more uh, question for now. Uh, maybe I'll ask a question for, for Josephine myself. Um, do, do you think the, the figure of the whistleblower uh, right now in, uh, in China is going to give um, a new meaning uh, to uh, public health? The, the figure of the whistle player, Sorry. The whistleblower, uh, like for example, yeah. uh, Doctor Doctor Lee, or yeah, Dr. Lee, like that. Yeah. Is, is is that a new uh, model for public health? Um, yeah, this is very interesting. It's like um, uh, I would say he's uh, the new Lei Feng. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, in this moral crusade, you know, kind of he um, he was a victim. Yeah, of the crisis, and now um, they have uh, you know kind of um, turned him into a hero, a martyr, yeah? And so he is no longer an individual, a victim. He is the hero of this political campaign, yeah? And so, um, you know, kind of um, by uh, this way that you can, um, so uh, it, it's a way, so, um, you know, kind of, of um, turning into sort of humanize the campaign. Yeah, so people can identify, can empathize, and can, you know, and then they can, 
they 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 start seeing themselves, you know, kind of as can contribute, has a part to play, um, and uh, so they can also become a hero in this war against the disease. And I mean, kind of, I, I, I use lay form, but you know, kind of in the sense that I see, um, I I don't know whether anyone has watched um, this this film. Kumu Feng Chun is about the Shisus Myosis campaign. Yeah, and there were uh, individuals, the heroine, and you know, he she was invented. Even her, they got her name wrong. Yeah, but it didn't really matter because she represented the mass, not the individual. So um, when you go to those endemic regions and when you visit Shisus Myosis Control um, museums, you, you suddenly realize I, I kind of it don't to me that every village. Um, they they say that Kumeizu came from their village. Yeah, th this is a way that you know, kind of people identify themselves with the campaign. So they start seeing themselves as the heroes. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah, a, a, a very interesting comparison. Um, I have uh, another question. Um, so can both speakers imagine a dialogue between their two presentations? Is there a space for post-pandemic imaginations within Chinese cultural production? Interesting. Christoy, I'll let you start first. And... Yeah, it's interesting. I haven't thought about that. I mean, I was watching this film. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, now, you may you may see the, the, the big uh, production where uh, the sun is going to destroy Earth and then Earth has to become a spaceship and and move uh, further away uh, in space. Have you watched that film? It's a Chinese film, a big, big production from last year, I think. Um, oh, yeah, uh, Wandering Earth. Wandering Earth, yes, that, that's the one. So I think that's interesting to see that, you know, big studios, you know, big productions in China are beginning to invest in kind of, you know, end of the world uh, stories, which I don't think it's very, was very, I mean, it was definitely not very common in the Mao area. I don't think it was. Uh, Shun, do you, do you, are you aware of other such big productions about the end of the world in Chinese cinema? Um, in the PRC, I mean, because there are, tai, there, there are things in Taiwan, but that's a different kind of uh, genre. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so this kind of shows the role of, of, of China in saving the world. And it is exactly, uh, you know, it, this this thing you're describing, you know, some sort of collectivism, but also some heroes there which are playing a key role. It's very Maoist, in, in, in fact. I mean, mm -hmm. if you, if, like, I've, I've read a lot of the Maoist stuff, you know, for my PhD, and, yeah. you know, it's, it's really interesting how this comes back, you know, as yeah. an imagination. You know, mm -hmm. it's not so much the lone hero, it's the collective action, it's the self-sacrifice, it's... Uh, it, it's it's the yeah, self sacrifice, of, isn't it? It's always yes, the, yes. Yes. so it's a lay fun kind of uh, yeah. yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how the the COVID nineteen pandemic, you know, feeds into this, and if there's going to be uh, cultural products of that sort in China. I'm not aware of any at the moment. I wonder whether it's also it's just some as you were talking. I just you know kind of whether this is a response to the criticism, uh, you know, kind of uh, this, uh, the Western criticism, you know, kind of of China being uh, sort of uh, you know the Chinese were ruining the earth, yeah. The Chinese were ruining everything. They basically they just passed you know kind of all the problems sort of you know kind of uh, the world's problem to China, yeah. And um, and obviously, you know, kind of because the you know kind of um, radical sort of you know kind of or the rapid development in China, sort of as such a big country, the um, we we are seeing China now. But this is obviously not the Chinese problem, yeah. And um, um, we've been there, you know, come the West has been there, and um, it's still there, and it hasn't gone away, but. Like three gorgeous dam in China got to all the criticism, but this is a global project. You know, Chinese didn't come up with it. You know, it was um, 
and they, it, the United States had to start it with dam building, you know, kind of, you know, the global trend of dam building the 20th century. And China was just part of that. And um, uh, remember, it was the United States actually, you know, kind of uh, first, on, even before uh, the communist era, during the nationalist era, that was the United States actually, you know, kind of were involved with, you know, kind of, um, all the, um, f um, the, 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 the ground to sort of, you know, kind of uh, um, research, et cetera, et cetera. Then in the 1980s, it was a Canada, the uh, uh, dam building is also a big issue in Canada now, you know, kind of with, you know, the indigenous communities, you know, kind of are suffering from that. And, um, and um, the, uh, the Can Canadians uh, actually did um, the feasibility study in the 1980s. For the Chinese, and but then the Chinese were blamed. So China become, you know, kind of, again China become this um, um, a, a useful sort of, you know, kind of um, um, the metaphorical sort of like you can trash everything, you can put all the trash onto China. It was the Ch Chinese were the problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think, I think that... the, the, there might be some kind of reaction towards that. You know, kind of we are doing something. You know. We are no, I mean, that, you know, the, the COVID-19 narrative, especially from the USA, is so sinophobic that, of course, it will elicit responses. There is. Yeah, there is yeah, we can see that historically, you know, kind of China, uh, the Ch Chinatown, for example, yeah, were the manners, you know, kind of for spreading, you know, kind of public health manners, yeah. You know, this is well documented. So immediately sort of jump at people, yeah, it was a Chinese, dirty Chinese, yeah. I have another question that just appeared uh, for Christos. Uh, I noticed a dialectic in the pandemic imaginary between the apoleptical imagination and the utopian one, based on the assumptions that the pandemic is revealing. Oh, it's, it, the, the question is not finished, sorry. Okay, so yes, uh, I mean, in the book, I actually argue against an apocalyptic reading of the yeah. next pandemic. It's it's a very complex question to cover over Zoom, but I think there is a different uh, temporality involved, uh, at least, you know, strictly speaking. Um, as far as utopia is concerned, uh, it I guess it depends on your stance. So if, uh, if someone is... Uh, you know, for the rejuvenation of, of nature and the demise of humankind, then this, yes, of course, it's utopian. But utopian in a human sense, no, it, it, it's not, right? And this is the, um, uh, you know, something that is, is interesting because, you know, I think, I think that COVID-19 may be changing things because we are seeing some utopian thinking um, emerging uh, during it. It's... You know, it's still too early to, to, to be sure about this, but it could change the way in which you think about pandemics um, eventually. Thank you. Um, so I don't see, we don't have uh, any more questions and it's uh, almost uh, uh, time uh, for us to uh, close this uh, webinar. So um, again, uh, thank you, Josine. Thank you, Christos, uh, for uh, these uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, we learned a lot about uh, 